Well, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our Bible study time, April 29, 2020, Tipton Baptist Church. Today I'm coming to you from actually my classroom at Great Commission where I teach Bible to high schoolers. Uh, five different content areas I teach here from 8th to 12th grade. Um, I was working today and uh, I didn't want to let too much more time pass until I had a chance to uh, share with you our Bible study for tonight. So it's coming from the classroom today. Officially, we're in class, in Bible study. So uh, I want to invite you as we're looking at uh, our next week of the Acts 4 philosophy, I'll invite you to John chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses 16 to 21 today. 16 to 21, so that's John 14, 16 to 21. As today, we're going to be doing a mid-study review and a challenge as we look at what we've learned so far in the Acts 4 philosophy and a challenge to see how is it applying in our lives or how can we compare with where we're at spiritually along with uh, what we're reading in Acts chapter 4 with these Christians. How can we filter these things together to see if we are Acts 4 Christians, if we are biblically sounded Christ-exalting Christians in the way that these early Christians were. So that's where we're going today, John 14, 16 to 21, as a mid-study break in challenge and review for Acts 4. Uh, I'm going to open in a word of prayer. I'm going to get right into our study. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for Acts. I thank you for all the storylines through the Bible that point to you. I thank you, God, that we can have a understanding of you through your word and that you always have provided a means for us to know you that's from you. Thank you for giving us truth about you from you, that we don't have to rely merely on a human who's broken and finite, but we rely on the God who's sovereign and infinite to give us an understanding of himself. God, that is who you are, and we thank you. As we pause today, looking at what it means to be an Acts 4 Christian, a Christian who proclaims and a Christian who's a praying person instinctively, God, help us to filter these characteristics of a Christian into our current situations in our lives to see if we are Christians who are biblical like the Acts 4 Christians were. So help us to see our own lives as you see them in reality and Lord challenge us to be more Christ-like as a result of our study today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So um, today where we're going to go is um, we're going to, again, do a quick review as we see an Acts 4 Christian. This is where we've come so far. An Acts 4 Christian is a, is a Christian who is um, a person who proclaims Jesus, who, who, who desires to proclaim and make much of Jesus. And it's also a Christian who instinctively is a, is a praying person. I would like to pause to consider what we've seen in study so far. There's a way of life seen here lived out by the first followers of Jesus. These first Christians, although the word Christian would not be coined yet until years later in Antioch as the church grew out and away from Jerusalem is when the term Christian actually was first used. We know that these were Christians and these first Christians, they had a belief in God in which their way of life, their philosophy of living was to be unashamedly Christ exalting and Christ reflecting, unapologetically loving and heralding Jesus to be the God man and unreservedly living out new life they had since they had been brought from death to life, as we see Paul speak of in Ephesians chapter 2. These Christians are seen to be a people who did, in fact, proclaim Jesus by the very way they lived and their pursuits as a way of life, and that they were an instinctively praying people. We, we looked at that over the last two weeks in our Bible study time. I would like, today, I, I'd like to consider this question. What was it, as we're looking at this Acts 4 group of Christians, what was it that caused such a passion and desire in these people? And we might have already answers beginning to be drummed up in our mind. But we should really take a look at this. To be an Acts 4 Christian or a Christian who is prepared to proclaim and who does so. And a Christian who is instinctively a prayerful person. Let's be reminded of what it was that caused these people who were Christians to be this way. I'd like us to consider what it was that caused such a passion and desire to live without fear. To be a proclaimer and a prayerful person. Christian, to live without any concern for what would happen to them in this earthly life. What was it that caused them to live with such a set of words to be spoken about Jesus as instinctive that when they fellowshiped and when they encouraged one another, their words were instinctively pointing to and promoting Jesus' renown and greatness? 
as they were called on the carpet to herald Jesus' name, as they, were, as they were called out by the non-believers and the religious leadership of the day and the other Gentiles, what was it that gave them such a passion to declare Jesus to the lost? What was it that caused them to pray using God's very word, uh, to ask for the very things that would inevitably cause them suffering and adversity and affliction in this earthly temporal life, and to ask for such things with joy, Let's be reminded of what it was that drew them to these lifestyle, philosophical, theological changes. What it was that fueled. Now the answer to that question, a simple answer is God. God is the one who fueled them and who was the one to bring about this change. Specifically though, we're going to see today in our passage in John 14, it was the Spirit of God dwelling and working into them the new life that Jesus promised during his earthly ministry. And it is the same spirit that indwells us as we grow to be Acts for philosophy Christians as well. But this begs another question. Is there evidence of the Acts for philosophy in my life? Is there evidence of the philosophy that we see instinctively being Christian, biblically Christian? Is there evidence in your lives? Where do I go to look to see if there's evidence? How do I look at that? And that's really what we're going to be digging into today as we consider filtering our lives in through the Acts 4 philosophy. Scripture will give evidence, we know this, but we're going to see how today, how we can consider God's Word in conjunction with our lives as we desire to grow in Christ's likeness, and if we, in fact, are growing in Christ's likeness. So this is the question we're asking ourselves as we're about halfway through the Acts 4 philosophy. We're going to look at John chapter 14, uh, verses 16 to 21. We're going to consider that question in conjunction with that passage. And uh, this week, maybe God can even grow us up to see what it is that he's doing in us as we're being honed and shaped more like an Acts 4 Christian. Uh, today, we're going to see in John chapter 14, God's word prevails. We're going to see that. And Jesus is going to be speaking. We're going to take from his words and see that when Jesus speaks, he is God. And when God speaks, it prevails including the lives of those who are followers of his, like those we see later in Acts 4. We're also going to see that God is the main focal point in all of the philosophy. As we're reviewing the Acts 4 philosophy, as we're looking at it in our own lives, we're going to come back to the center to remember what it's all about to begin with. And that is God. He is the focus. He is the focal point. He's the main character of all the Bible. He's the hero of the story because it's his story. All of history is his story. So we're going to see that today. Uh, in our study. Let's look at John 14, 16 to 21 together. And uh, uh, just follow along as I read. I have it on the screen here. If you'd like to read it with me, have your Bibles open. We'll go from there. Uh, John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will also know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Today, we're going to look at these verses, and we're going to identify how God's word does prevail. There are six things that we can see which will confirm our passion or confirm that we are not as passionate as we should be as Acts 4 Christians. His word dictates all that will be. God's word is the authoritative word. And we see six things in this passage in John 14 that begin to show us a foundation of a framework of belief in our lives, the belief that makes us Christian. And we see that evidence in Acts chapter 4. But let's turn it on ourselves and say, are we Christian? Are we truly proclaimers and prayerful people the way the Bible describes? Not merely the way we've heard in a Sunday school by a Sunday school teacher or a very special person that's close to us. Has the Bible described something that we can relate to and we can say, yes, that's what we are? The Bible itself. God's word is authoritative and it is what dictates all that is and will be. In this passage, we see six things that confirm our passion. Here's the first three on the screen behind me. Uh, the first thing we see is this. 
By God's word, we are brought to life. We see that in verse 19. In verse 19, quickly, if we look in our passage, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. That's Jesus' very word. By his word, we're brought to life. We know that we are brought to life because in uh, the book of Ephesians, in the letter uh, to the Ephesians from Paul, we see what it's like to be brought to life. In him, we have resurrection. In him, we see all through chapter 1, it is in Jesus we have a hope and an inheritance in the future. He's the one who's brought us to life. God's word prevails because when he declares we will be made alive, we are made alive. God is that powerful and authoritative. Acts 4 Christians have been brought to life. We as Christians have been brought to life. God's word is what does it. When Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb in John chapter 11, it was by God's word that Lazarus came to life. Lazarus didn't just merely decide to come to life. God's word called to him, and God said, Come out of there, Jesus said. Come out of the tomb, Lazarus, by name. It's no different. An Acts 4 Christian is a person who God has called by name, come to life. And just like that, his spirit brings us to life. God's word's authoritative, and it dictates all that is, including our spiritual new life in him. And when God's called us to life, we can look at our lives as we're filtering our pursuits and desires through Acts 4, and we can remember that it is by his word we've been brought to life. As we think about this, the Spirit of God may just be resonating. Yes, I am the one who has saved you. Yes, I am the one who's brought you to life. Yes, I am the one who is the hero. Yes, I am the one who you're desiring to herald to the world and to your households and to others in the church. The Spirit of God is the one who's brought us to life. This should confirm in us a passion that we have for him, that yes, he's the hero. Yes, he's the one I desire to make much of. The second thing we see here is this, that by God's word, he, he promises his presence or the spirit of truth to be in us forever, and that only those who are alive receive new life and receive and know his spirit. We see this in verse 16 and 17a. Look with me in verse 16 and 17a. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. We know that it is by God's word that he promises his presence who is the spirit of truth. And that his presence will live and dwell with us and in us forever. And that only those who have been brought to life by God's word have his presence. Today if we're playing the church game. If we're playing the game and we show up to church because it's our duty, if we're showing up to church because I'm obligated to, we don't have a passion for his name being made great because we know he, by his own word, brought us to life. If we're playing the church game and we know that he's promised his presence, but we know that we don't have a, a sense or an understanding that God is with us, we feel alone and that he's not, I'm wondering if that is a game that we're playing and we're really missing what the Bible says is an Acts 4 Christian, which is a biblical Christian. Are we people who have been brought to life and we know we've been brought to life because we hear his voice that which brought us to life. We hear him and we sense the presence of him. As we read God's word, there's a connection that we sense, a presence of God in reading God's word because it's from him. Is this what we see as an Acts 4 Christian who desires to proclaim and to pray? Do we desire that? By God's word, he promised his presence which is the spirit of truth. Do, do we sense a presence of his spirit when we're in his word? Do we know him this way? The third thing that I want to see in this passage of these six things, the third thing is this, that by God's word, we have a new father who comes to us. He made the first move. Remember, we were dead, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we see here in verse um, 18 of John chapter 14, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He's not leaving us an orphan. He's become our new father as he's by his word brought us to life and by his word made a promise that he will live in us by his spirit and through his spirit dwelling in us and he'll be our father and that we have a new father, a new relationship with a new loving father. 
This is a mark of an Acts 4 Christian. This is what it means to be a biblical Christian. By his word, we have the Father who comes to us. Keep in mind in Ephesians 2, we who were dead in trespasses and sins, we were dead. God made the first move because he came to us. Dead people can't just say, oh, today I want to be anything. They're dead. Spiritually, it's no different. Spiritually, when we're dead, we need him, the Father, not to leave us orphaned and dead. We need him to come to us, and he has. He's, by his word, kept his promise that he would come to us. And for those of us who are followers of his, he has. Can we filter that into our lives today? Can we say that he has come to me? He is my father. I am not an orphan. I'm adopted into a royal family. Can we say that as an Acts 4 Christian? The fourth thing we see is this, that that what the Father desires is what Jesus desires, and it is what we will begin to desire. What the Father desires is what Jesus desires, and that's what we will begin to desire. In John 14, verse 20, we see, At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. What the Father desires is what Jesus desires. He is in his Father. And it is what we will begin to desire. Jesus living in us, or his Spirit in us. An Acts 4 Christian, the mark of an Acts 4 Christian is a mark that our desires begin to shift. What we want and pursue begins to change. Our proclaiming is something that becomes desire. And I don't mean buttonholing people on the street and just blasting in their face Jesus is Lord and he saves while that might be true that's that's weak in comparison to the kind of desires that God gives by his promised spirit through us the very desires and the very lens with which Jesus had seen and that God sees the very pursuits that God has those become the pursuits of the biblical acts for Christian what it is that God's motive is and revealing himself to the world becomes our motive to reveal him to the world. Our pursuits and desires become his because God was in Jesus. Jesus' desires were his father's. Jesus' very spirit lives in us. So our desires are what it is that he desired. Some of the tag words that are known, that we know from Galatians 5, are fruit of the spirit. Fruit or results of the spirit living in us. The fruit that is born out of the believer is love and joy and peace. These things that are fruit of the Spirit are not just uh, something for children to memorize or for adults to know about. These are the evidences that the Spirit of God lives in us and is dwelling in us as believers. These are the marks of an Acts 4 Christian. Do we have these evidences that our desires are shifting and changing and, and lining up with God's desires? Do we want what He wants? So this is a, a thing that we see in John 14 where God's Word is prevailing. And we can see that it it applies to the Acts 4 Christians just as much as it does to us. The fifth thing that we see is that, that these desires will culminate on desiring what God wants out of love for him and desire for him and his name to be made great and not mere duty alone. Verse 21, we see this. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. These desires that, that Jesus had, that God has, become our desires. And we begin obeying God's commandments as we see in verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. We have to have this priority in mind. We have to have this in mind uh, as far as the order of operations. We don't keep his commandments to show him that we love him. That's not how it works. Biblically, we keep his commandments because he first loved us and we can't help ourselves but love him in return. It's not to show him, look what I can do, God, I can obey you. It's by his spirit indwelling in us that we keep his commandments out of desire, not mere duty alone. If we're, again, if we're playing the church game to do what the pastor says or, or to do what I learned in Sunday school, just to do it so I've done my duty out of obligation, that is weak, that is not out of passionate love for God. While, yes, we have a Christian duty, God never speaks of what he's obligated us to do as obligation, but as you will be compelled by my spirit in you that you won't be able to help yourself, just as Peter said in Acts 4. We can't help ourselves but speak the name of Jesus, he said to the religious leadership who threatened his life. 
An Acts 4 Christian is a Christian whose desires line up with God's and it is out of passionate love for God because His Spirit dwells in us. Our obedience is a result of His Spirit in us. It is not that we obey to get His Spirit in us. It doesn't, never works that way. So let's make an easy note of this in John 14 and then apply it to the Acts 4 Christians as those principles apply to us. If we think we're going to be obedient to God, to please Him, there might be a truth in that statement, but there's something that we're missing that should be stated, and that is our obedience that pleases Him is fueled by His Spirit in us. He made the first move. He didn't leave us orphaned. He came to us first. He's the one who gets the glory because he's the one who's given us his spirit to do the work, to, to obey his commands. It was him who gave us his spirit first, and the fruit of that spirit are the very things that we can see as obedience to his word. That is fruit. We don't create it. God did. That's his spirit living in us. The sixth thing we see is this, that God will confirm our new desires uh, because he will make himself known to you. Again, we see this in verse 21. He'll make himself know, known to us through us pursuing his desires. Verse 21 in John 14 again. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and show myself to him, manifest myself to him. God will show himself to us as we pursue the things he pursues. This is an absolute essential mark of an Acts 4 Christian, of a 2020 Christian. When we're pursuing what God's desires are, you will see evidences of His presence, not only in you, but in the work that you're doing. You'll see His hand on things that you could not take credit for. You'll see Him being pointed at to, to receive praise and honor and glory for work that He's doing through you. As you're obeying His commands, all of the noteworthiness of your obedience should culminate on pointing right back to him as the great one who's caused you to be a child of his, no longer orphaned, and has indwelled you with his spirit to give you new desires and a passion to request things in prayer that are what he would want for you, not what you merely want as a human alone. God will confirm your desires that are his because he will make himself known to you. That's a promise we see. It's the sixth point we see in Acts for Christians as evidenced by God's word prevailing in John 14. The second thing I want to look at this today, and we're going to close on this, the Acts 4 philosophy. I said we'll see that God's word prevails. We just looked at six ways that we see God's word prevailing in a Christian. And the second thing for, this, for today's Bible study is the Acts 4 philosophy. We see God as the main focal point. As we consider what made these people in Acts 4 live this way and quickly identify it was the Spirit of God working in them which fueled this new life living that they had. We must ask ourselves, do we want God to be seen more and more through our daily activities? Through our regular, daily, what would be considered mundane activities, are we wanting God to be, to be seen and to have praise given Him through our regular, daily activities? Is that something that we've even thought of? Do we want that at all? Are are our prayer requests moving in the direction of placing ourselves in this life in such a position so as to have God seen as glorious? In other words, are we asking God and requesting from Him things that by Him answering those requests with a yes, He'll be seen as greater. He'll be seen as magnificent. He gets to all the focus. Are our requests being shaped that way? Remember, the main focal point in the X4 philosophy, again, it is God. Do we want his name to be heralded as amazing because of how we live and what we pursue? Our pursuits and our prayer requests are proclaiming something. They are speaking to all those around us who are watching us chase after what we love. If the Spirit of God's working in our new life in him, our pursuits are changing. Our desires are not what those who do not love God are. Our desires are what God loves and what God desires, and that's what's beginning to shift and change. So today, test yourself. As we review and we're challenged with John chapter 14, looking at these six things where God's word has prevailed, all culminating to pointing at Jesus as God as the main focal point, this way of living, this philosophy of living, it comes through God's word being proven in those he's brought to life. 
The application is this, to test ourselves and consider these six things we see in John 14 and filter and apply them in our personal, most intimate portions of our life. Can we filter these things through our lives so much so that we see our life taking the shape of one who loves God and know this so much that we are becoming more like Jesus and what Jesus was and what he wanted? Are our pursuits becoming his? Take another look at John 14. Reread these verses, except go from verses 16 through 21 and continue to verse 24. That's our homework in class this week. Take a spiritual inventory of our heart's position, what it is that we want, what it is that we want to be seen out of our lives and proclaim with our living, what it is that we're requesting from God, and to see if our requests, if the, the very requests themselves will cause a visual of God to be broader and brighter and clearer. Uh, these are the results of our requ requests. Are we a person who proclaims Jesus instinctively and is a person of prayer in which God's desires are fulfilled before our desires alone? So these are the questions to ask ourselves as we pause in our Acts 4 study. There's a lot here, and it's not a, by accident that there's a lot here. You can watch this again if you want, or go back and hear a couple of these points. Look at the verses. Apply them to your place right now in life, in your position with the Lord, in your quiet time with Him. Maybe you'll find that your quiet time hasn't been what it's, it should have been. Maybe you'll find that your requests have been really self-centered and not God-centered. Maybe we'll find that even our very work for the church and desire for the church to grow, we've lost our zeal to have Him be made known as great. Maybe some of these things will come up. Maybe something I haven't said, and if I haven't said it, it's on your mind and now it's highlighted. May God add his blessing to you as you commit to the truths, these six things in John 14, 16 to 21, as they apply to the Acts 4 Christians and we see them lived out by them, and as we ask God to help them be applied to our lives today. So God bless. We'll see you next time. Keep reading in Acts 4. Get into John. And may he bless you as you commit to these truths. Bye-bye.